Hello, I'm Alex Akavon, and you're listening to May It Please the Court. The U.S. Supreme Court has been responsible for some key moments in American history. Some of those key moments you might remember, like the day the court legalized same-sex marriage nationwide, or recognized a woman's right to get an abortion. Other moments that we don't talk about as much still gave us rights that we often take for granted, like when the court legalized homosexuality, interracial marriage, or even contraception. Still, other moments are long forgotten, but were pivotal to the development of the nation, like when the Supreme Court determined domestic economic policy for decades until President FDR threatened to overhaul the entire system. But what if I told you that all of those key moments and landmark cases were each decided based on different interpretations of the same sentence? What if one sentence in the Constitution is responsible for an entire generation of economic policy? Americans' right to access contraception, marry someone of a different race, get an abortion, be homosexual, and marry someone of the same sex. What if that sentence was found in one clause of one section of one constitutional amendment? And what if that sentence helped create the world we live in today? This is the story of that sentence. This is the story of the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. This case involves the validity of the Connecticut anti-contraceptive statutes. Those who are opposed to racial intermarriage. The power to force a woman to continue or to end a pregnancy against her will. Engaging in any form of consensual sexual intimacy that the state happens to disapprove of. The intimate and committed relationships of same-sex couples. Justice, may it please the court. At the start of 1865, the U.S. was in its final year of a bloody civil war. The U.S. Constitution at the time had a total of 12 amendments, 10 from the Bill of Rights, plus two others that had made adjustments to the judicial branch and the Electoral College rules. President Abraham Lincoln was working on the 13th. After issuing the Emancipation Proclamation that had declared slaves free, Lincoln knew that he needed nothing less than a constitutional prohibition on slavery to be able to keep his promise. Finally, on January 31st, 1865, the House of Representatives voted to pass the 13th Amendment, which forbids slavery or involuntary servitude, unless it was punishment for a crime. But to become official, three quarters of the states have to ratify an amendment. And at that time, we had 36 states. So the magic number was 27. By the time Lincoln was assassinated, 20 states had ratified the amendment. But on December 6th, 1865, Georgia became number 27, making the 13th Amendment an official part of the U.S. Constitution. But the Confederate states, who just lost the Civil War and reluctantly agreed to end slavery, weren't exactly keen on just accepting former slaves as equal citizens. So, newly freed slaves were continuing to encounter a lot of adversity and often violence. In response, the Federal Congress, still controlled by Lincoln's Republican Party, knew that they had to do something, so they passed the nation's first civil rights law that was designed to ensure that all citizens would be equally protected. But there was still one big problem. When the Constitution was originally drafted, 
The framers were pretty clear that the federal government would have very limited power over the states. The federal government could collect taxes, handle issues between different states, and declare war. But where in the Constitution does it say that the federal Congress can tell southern states that they cannot discriminate based on race? Well, it didn't. In fact, there was nothing in the Constitution that directly gave the federal government such a say in state laws. And so, Congress realized that they needed another amendment. One that would ensure the equal protection of the laws for all citizens and would guarantee citizenship for anyone born in the U.S. without regard to race. They needed a 14th Amendment. The goal was to explicitly give the Federal Congress the authority to pass civil rights laws. Well, politics being politics, they argued about the issue for a long time. Southern Democrats were generally opposed to all of this. Moderate Republicans, meanwhile, wanted to ensure equal protection, but were willing to compromise. Meanwhile, radical Republicans, led by Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner, did not want to compromise. They wanted an amendment to ensure civil rights and voting rights for all black citizens. So yes, the radical Republicans of the 1860s were radically in favor of defending civil rights for black Americans. But while these politicians were furiously arguing, nobody was really talking about how this would affect the Supreme Court. The court, after all, had claimed the power to overturn unconstitutional laws, although they rarely ever did so before the Civil War. And this was going to add to the Constitution, after all. But mostly due to contrary political views, the Republicans at the time were not big fans of the nation's highest court, and they did not take the justices very seriously. But what they didn't realize was that as they debated the future of the United States, they were writing into the Constitution words that would give the Supreme Court a power that was far greater than any of them could have possibly imagined. On July 9th, 1868, the 14th Amendment was officially ratified and then announced to the public a few weeks later. The final version was five sections long ensured citizenship rights, and guaranteed the equal protection of the laws for all citizens. Congress decided to punt on the voting rights issue for the 15th Amendment to be ratified later. But buried in the middle of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment are these words. No state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law. Now, that was actually not the first time those words appeared in the Constitution. The Fifth Amendment has pretty much the exact same language, except for one crucial difference. The Fourteenth Amendment applied to the states. No state shall deprive. That officially gave power to the federal government, and by extension the U.S. Supreme Court, to pass judgment on certain laws and policies of individual states. Any state law that deprived a person of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law would be struck down by the Supreme Court as unconstitutional. And that's how the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause was born, as part of an effort to secure equal rights for newly freed slaves. So how did the choice to include the Due Process Clause eventually lead to the legalization of abortion and same-sex marriage nationwide? Well, as with most things in the law world, it all comes down to interpretation. What does due process of law mean? And so, the 1870s gave birth to a new legal debate. A debate that even our own current Supreme Court is still having. The debate over procedural due process and substantive due process. Let's start with the first one. You can pretty intuitively read due process as being about a fair process or a fair procedure. So maybe the clause means that states can deprive you of life, liberty, or property, 
but only as long as there was a fair process. For example, let's say you work for the government and you get fired for no reason at all, without a chance to defend yourself or a hearing or anything like that. Well, that doesn't seem very fair. Maybe a private corporation can fire whoever it wants to, but the government? What if the government only fired public school teachers that have certain political viewpoints? Surely the government needs to have fair procedures in place. And so a lot of legal scholars believe that that's all the due process clause was meant to do. Just guarantee a fair process. When you hear due process in the news, like when people say they were deprived of due process, they're usually talking about this idea of a fair procedure. Now, no one really disagrees with the idea of procedural due process. Many cases have come and gone where the court decides what processes were fair and what weren't. But over time, more and more legal scholars have found that the due process clause actually does way more. Lawyers in the late 1800s started arguing that the sentence should not be read as due process of law, but instead as due process of law. It's not just about a fair legal procedure. It's about what laws are allowed to be passed in the first place. This way of thinking became known as substantive due process. So to illustrate the difference, if you agree with the procedural only folks and you read it as due process of law, then the focus is on the person who's been deprived of their liberty. Was that person given a fair process? But when you look at it the other way, when you look at it as due process of law, the focus becomes on the government's law itself. Does that law deprive anyone of life, liberty, or property? If so, then the law needs to have gone through its own due process, which basically means that the government has to justify it. Unlike most laws that states can just pass with majority approval, laws that deprive you of life, liberty, or property have to be justified with a compelling reason. So even just a few years after it was ratified, the due process clause was making a splash in the legal world. Is it just about procedure? Or is it also about substance? Because if it's about substance, then that means the Supreme Court can strike down state laws that it determines are not sufficiently justified. Now the concern here was a democratic one. Shouldn't laws be left up to the people to decide, not a bunch of judges? Nine unelected justices can overturn the laws that people vote on? But the substantive team argues that, well, there are simply laws that the government should not be able to pass. Popular support or not, the government just shouldn't be able to deprive you of life, liberty, or property, unless it has a really good reason. Our story is about the evolution of substantive due process. Because once the concept was born, it would begin a 150-year journey that would connect the milestone moments that shaped our world today. The 14th Amendment had inserted language into the Constitution that arguably limited state governments from passing certain laws without proper justification for the purpose of defending our civil liberties. Now, progressives today tend to like that idea. Broadly speaking, modern liberal justices are on the substantive due process team, and conservatives are the ones who are typically saying no procedural due process only. And that kind of makes sense. Fundamental liberties today sounds like civil rights, and progressives tend to champion that as their core issue. But that was not the case in the late 1800s. The legal world was not talking about those types of civil rights. I know that the point was to protect newly freed slaves, but they were mostly covered by the Equal Protection Clause that comes later in the 14th Amendment. On the Due Process Clause issue, the lawyers who were passionately arguing for civil rights were actually talking about business interests. 
and the procedure versus substance debate back then was about regulating businesses. And it wasn't so much conservative versus liberal, it was more capitalist versus diehard extreme capitalists. And we need to remember that this was the Wild West after all. It was the era of Calamity Jane and Wild Bill Hickok. Government wasn't nearly as involved in day-to-day life as it is now. Disagreements back then were solved with duels and shootouts. Californians who'd arrived for the gold rush just a few decades earlier were still a part of this whole finders keepers mentality. What's mine is mine, what's yours is yours, and the government stays out of everything. It's just pretty much how the country thought. And business owners wanted to keep it that way. People like Karl Marx, who is still alive at this point, have been writing about the flaws with capitalism signaling to fiscal conservatives that the government might start inserting itself into business activity. So business attorneys wanted to find a way to ensure their clients that the government wouldn't tell them how to run their business. And until the 14th Amendment was ratified, there was nothing in the Constitution they could really use. But now, they could use this fundamental liberty concept. With substantive due process logic, if they could prove that economic laws deprive business owners of some sort of liberty, then they could have the law struck down as unconstitutional. Or at least that was the dream. For the next couple of decades, the Supreme Court was not very keen on this whole idea of striking down state laws. The concept didn't really catch on all through the 1870s and 1880s. But the business lawyers kept on making the argument. They kept saying that, you know what, there are still areas that the government should not be able to enter. And they were arguing that business is one of those areas. They figured it was a matter of time, surely, before business owners could get fiscal conservatives on the bench. Justices who would see things their way and help ensure business autonomy for all time. Finally, In 1884, they got their chance. Grover Cleveland won the presidential election, becoming the first Democrat to do so since before the Civil War. Cleveland brought a strongly pro-business philosophy to the White House, and with his new responsibilities as president, he had the power to start appointing new justices. But then, Cleveland lost re-election in 1888, A pretty big disappointment for the diehard capitalists. But President Grover Cleveland didn't stop there. He ran again in 1892 and won, becoming the only president to serve two non-consecutive terms. This time, he made it a mission to get fiscal conservatives on the court. When an opportunity came to nominate a justice, Cleveland's first choice was a man named Wheeler Peckham. But that nomination was blocked, so he appointed Justice Edward Douglas White. But then in 1895, when another opportunity presented itself, Cleveland chose Wheeler Peckham's younger brother, Rufus Peckham. They must have been quite the pro-business family. Rufus Peckham was the judicial champion that business interests were hoping for. Peckham believed in the free market and for each person's right to work free from any government infringement. And he was ready to use his position on the Supreme Court to protect economic rights based on his no-regulation philosophy that kept the government out of business activity. Now that probably sounds like the right type of thinking if you're a libertarian-minded person today. But again, the context of the nation in the 1800s was far, far more to the right than it is now. The issues back then were not about providing health care or maternity leave. The issues back then were about any form of regulation whatsoever. Peckham and his supporters wanted to even make things like minimum wage unconstitutional. So not just vote against minimum wage, but outright prohibit it. With Rufus Peckham now on the bench, along with other Democrat-appointed fiscal conservatives, 
The Supreme Court now started focusing less on equally protecting newly freed slaves and more on protecting business autonomy. And now that the 14th Amendment gave the federal courts the power to declare state laws unconstitutional, all Peckham had to do was wait for the right case. Just two years after he joined the court, Peckham got his first chance to make history. In 1897, the court heard a case called Al Geyer v. Louisiana, which involved the regulation of local insurance companies. Louisiana had banned out-of-state insurance corporations from transacting business in the state. One local Louisiana company had bought insurance from New York in violation of the statute, so the case went up to the Supreme Court. The justices decided unanimously to strike down the Louisiana law. But curiously, the person assigned to write the opinion was Justice Peckham. Now, Peckham could write a precedent to change the nation. He invalidated the Louisiana law, but his reasoning was that the law had violated the 14th Amendment. He said that the law had deprived citizens of life, liberty, or property without sufficient justification without the due process of law. But how? No one was deprived of life or property in that case, so it had to come down to liberty. The law deprived citizens of their liberty. But what liberty? And here, Peckham had to be precise. He needed something broad enough to be able to use later to strike down more economic laws, but he also had to specify what liberty was being deprived. And so Peckham chose the words, liberty to contract. And so, for the first time, the Supreme Court recognized a liberty to contract in the 14th Amendment, the freedom for each person to enter into whatever contracts they choose, even if they're unfair and even if they're problematic. It was a major victory for business lawyers, but it still wasn't quite enough. The Louisiana law had been quite specific, and they wanted as broad of an interpretation as possible. They needed a situation where the court could clearly and explicitly declare any interference with business activity as unconstitutional. And so all they could do was wait for the right case to present itself. The liberty to contract was now a narrow precedent. They needed to make it a legal doctrine. But what Peckham and the business lawyers didn't realize was that while they were all celebrating the new recognition of a fundamental right, the man they were looking for was baking bread in New York City. That man's name was Joseph Lochner, and his case would one day be in every constitutional law textbook in the country. And that's because Rufus Peckham and his colleagues would use Joseph Lochner's case to define an entire era of American history. The Lochner Era. We'll hear more about Joseph Lochner and how he set American economic policy for an entire generation in episode two. May It Please the Court is produced by Untwist the Facts. Check out our website at www.untwistthefacts.com or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Untwist the Facts. I'm Alex Akavon, and thanks so much for listening.